Oh, okay. So welcome everyone to week eight of the Open Life Science Gamble 4. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of creative muting. Okay, um, so I'm going to run through our basic reminders and then we're going to launch straight into our very first talk. Uh, it's lovely to have you here, folks. Um, so uh, first reminder, folks, is we have a code of conduct. Um, and what we mean with the code of conduct, it's best to read it to get the full details. But broadly, this is treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive. Um, and if at any point you witness or experience anything that you believe is not in line with the code of conduct or is not acceptable behavior, you can report that um, either directly to one of the Open Life Science organizers um, or uh, to our team email, which is team at openlifesci.org. Right now on our Etherpad notes, that's lines 73 and 74 have the email addresses to report this. Um, we have an otter.ai transcript, which just allows you to follow on what's being said. Uh, it's automatically machine transcribed. There's a link on line 75 or in your Zoom. It is uh, on the top left where it says live on Otter AI. You can open that up to follow along. Um, and since we will have breakout rooms, we'll just quickly request that everyone modify their names in Zoom. Um, because breakout rooms aren't transcribed in Otter. And so in order to facilitate participation for everyone, we ask that people choose either spoken or written breakout rooms. So um, to change your name on the participant screen in Zoom, at least on my computer, I right click um, on the more button and then I can choose to rename um, and then add either a W in front of your name if you prefer written breakout rooms. Or if you prefer to speak, then you can add an S in front of your name. So Emmy has a nice example there, um, as do a few of you have already added the S's in front. It just helps us sort people into the breakout room based on their preference. Um, I think that that is all of the intro stuff. Hopefully I haven't missed anything. Uh, so over to my fantastic co-host Emmy to introduce the first talk. Thank you, Yo. Lovely job as usual. Um, yeah, welcome folks. Uh, I'm super excited about today's topic, which is all about community design for inclusivity. Um, and this is a super important topic. Um, you can refer to the uh, quote on line 81, which I don't know why we haven't put like, I, I would love to find out who said this. <laughs> but um, but uh, basically, yeah, we believe that all of you joined us because you're all open leaders and um, you'd like to build awesome open science projects that are inclusive and accessible and um, and uh, allow everyone to participate. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to uh, have a few lovely speakers here today uh, who will share their experience and a few frameworks to help you think about how to build um, communities around your projects in an inclusive manner. Um, and uh, Without further ado, it's really my honor to introduce Chat, who will talk about the mountain of engagement. Hey, thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, I may be a bit rusty, please bear with me. I've been working mostly behind the scenes to help others with their presentations for the past uh, two years now or so. I'm going to do my best, but yes, absolutely. Let's talk about the mountain of engagement. Uh, hi, I'm Chad Sansing. I'm from the Mozilla Foundation. I work on our MozFest team putting on the Mozilla Festival each year, uh, now heading into its second virtual festival in 2022. And I work in a variety of community engagement roles with our uh, facilitators, newcomers, volunteers, our ambassadors who help kind of spread the word about the festival. And it's really just a pleasure to talk shop with you here today. Um, before we go into the mountain of engagement proper, I just want to uh, thank and acknowledge everyone I've learned from that has helped me along my way to improve my facilitative kind of leadership practice. Colleagues and mentors like uh, Abby Cavanaugh Mays, uh, Tammy Popo, Akaya Winwood, and many more. I want to, of course, acknowledge you as the experts in your communities and the networks uh, in which and with which you work. And I really hope that what I have to share today will be valuable to you and to your you know, colleagues, mentees, and the like. And I uh, just want to acknowledge that um, you know, privilege has, uh, in part, perhaps large part, brought me here today where I am physically, uh, where I am online as a person. I hope that what I have to share kind of mitigates uh, some of the harm that's come with that privilege. And uh, if you have any feedback you'd like to pass along anonymously through your organizers, I would love to have it. 
So let's talk about the mountain of engagement. I'm going to kind of riff off the notes that are in the slides there. I'm not going to follow them too dogmatically, but they're there for your reference after our time here together today. So the mountain of engagement is kind of like, uh, it could be an iceberg of engagement. It could be many things. It could be more of a matrix. Maybe it's lateral, not vertical. But the idea is to take a moment and to use the mountain of engagement as a method for thinking about the many different ways community members engage with your project. Pardon me as my entire screen goes blank for a second due to some wonderful wire. Here we go, we're back. Um, it's a way to think about the, the journey someone might take from say onboarding to a very like high level of uh, deeply engaged contribution to your work. But it's also a way to consider how people move between those different opportunity for a really long time uh, how and why they might leave the community, come back to it in a different way. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a method for asking yourself questions about how you are kind of organizing maybe the contributor or the participant experience in your work. So you, it's something you can use to discover the ways people are interacting with the work itself, but also with one another. Uh, it's something you can use to discover how people are interacting with your organization or, or the project uh, as an entity. Uh, it's something you can use to kind of interrogate how people are interacting with the culture or contributing to it or experiencing difficulty. Uh, as I said before, uh, it's a way to look at how folks move between different opportunities. And then as you get to understand what makes someone feel kind of comfortable, confident, and content to move between those opportunities, it gives you ideas about how to maybe streamline or expand or otherwise revise what you're doing as a project lead. Uh, to really encourage people to contribute where they feel best contribute. So you might think of it again as a, as a matrix from onboarding to kind of becoming a leader in your particular project, community, or culture. You might think of it as a kind of, uh, to borrow a phrase, a, a story engine, uh, a way to learn from the people who are working with you, what brought them to the work, what keeps them in the work, what pulls them away from the work from time to time, to understand those stories better and to use those stories to inform the decisions you're making about onboarding and cooperating. It's a way to manage what uh, my colleague Abby uh, calls multipliers and returners. You know, oftentimes we think of maybe graduates or alumni, which are great things to be and carry this connotation of successful completion and moving on to the next thing. But we know that, you know, projects uh, sometimes thrive and depend on people coming back or people bringing more people back with them. And so it's a way to really understand what motivates the returners, what motivates those multipliers and keeps them engaged and engaging others in the project. It's a great diagnostic tool. You can ask yourself questions about community health in your own leadership, form of self-assessment there. Uh, you can really look at it from the, the value exchange, like an equitable value exchange lens. So, you know, what makes people value doing this kind of work in the project, but not this kind of work in the project? How could we shift that? Or is it different for different types of people. What can we learn? How can we frame it? That's really, you know, that a great starting point maybe uh, for a conversation about metrics that have to do with growth or impact, but probably not an endpoint for those. It's a way where if you notice, you know, some things are kind of moving right along, uh, almost ideally, like, oh, this contributor workflow seems to be okay. Lots of people are there, enough people are there, it's getting done, it seems to be contentment, it's good. You can then give your attention to things that maybe you wish were working better in the project. And that's kind of a, the, the project's DNA comes from a remix of like advocacy and like email open rates. It was a very kind of uh, clinical statistical piece that we tried to make uh, through Mozilla's open leadership program. Uh, and when I say we I'm talking about uh, me, Abby and me, Abby and I, um, a, a way to kind of make that kind of measurement much more humane and, and kind of story and relationship driven, not just numbers driven. So how does the mountain of engagement work? Well, this is a very kind of like uh, unnuanced, quick tour of, of the process that, that we developed and that we share. You can, of course, adapt this. You can turn it into anything that is useful to you. But, you know, maybe start by brainstorming or creating a map of all the different ways people interact with your work or project, just like everything, very expansive, very inclusive. Then, you know, from those, you know, many items, see if you can group them into three to five categories of work or contribution that are deepening in terms of engagement. Is there, for example, an, an entry point, a midpoint, and a, an end point or a graduation point? You know, something like that. 
you know, get your interactions into those different bands. Um, then you can begin, you know, talking with one another as project organizers. Are there people who seem to be moving between those bands? How frequently are they doing it? Is it because they want to? Is it because they feel pressured to? Like, what, what's at work there? What makes someone go from, you know, newcomer to veteran in the community, for example? Once you know kind of like who's moving, you can start to have conversations with them. Uh, you can find out what's working for them, what's not working for them, right? You don't have to answer these questions yourself. You can go to these folks who, you know, this are moving around through different bands of engagement with the project. You can then think about, you know, which of those opportunities seem maybe like especially hard to attain or maybe not accessible or not inclusive enough and broaden those and make them, uh, you know, more perhaps attractive or equitable for more people who are involved in your project or community. And then, you know, once you've done that prioritization and you've kind of uh, maybe revised some of these exchanges and you're trying some things out and talking with people, how's this working? How did it feel to change from this role to that role? Then you can continue to reflect on that mountain of engagement. Uh, your role as a leader and kind of like, you know, how, you know, how well uh, do, how well are people moving in ways that they seem to want to move, right? That, that is the trick. So step one, uh, interactions. These could be, you know, tweets and retweets all the way through grant applications, pull requests, folks who are hosting online events for you, things like that. Deepening bands of engagement, you know, you could think of it from first contact to sustained engagement to leadership. You could think of it from user to contributor to lead or owner. Uh, we think of it as someone who's learning about MozFest to someone who's maybe endorsing or encouraging others to go to MozFest, then someone who participates in MozFest, then maybe someone who joins MozFest as a facilitator or a wrangler and helps arrange part of the festival. And then we think of them as kind of like a community leader or a returner or a multiplier, someone who comes back after all. You know, get your interactions then into those bands. So maybe like, you know, the, the tweets, the retweets, the likes, the comments would go into an earlier band and something like, you know, hosting an online uh, workshop or, or, you know, like brain jam on your project or something it might be at a very deep level of engagement. When you are looking for those people who then move across those bands and you start that kind of search, think about uh, you know, getting you know, some time just, just to talk and to learn uh, what's working for them. Um, are there places where they get stuck? Do they wanna be stuck? Do they not wanna be stuck? You know, not everybody wants to go all the way up, let's say a mountain of engagement. Some people find a campsite where they're really comfortable and they wanna stay there. Some people need to move backwards. They wanna move backwards. Maybe there's a prior role that's more comfortable or maybe other commitments come up and they still wanna contribute. And it's great that you have this other way for them to give to the project, something like that. Um, are people leaving? Why are they leaving? Um, are there successes that you can repeat? Are there you know, failures that you can avoid? Are there lessons that you can learn? Are the patterns that you see demonstrative of the values you hold in your culture and in your project? Or do they uh, maybe suggest uh, a culture that's different from what you hope it might be? And then, you know, what are those value exchanges at each level of the mountain? Do they seem equitable to you? Do they seem equitable to participants? Are there ways to adjust them or make them flexible to really meet exactly what it is contributors would like to get from your project in return for the things they are contributing to it? Ask those questions, you know, learn from those folks who are moving up and down and then use the feedback that they give you to start prioritizing your work uh, to create maybe uh, uh, more equitable, accessible, and inclusive kinds of opportunities for people who want to move, but also for people who want to, you know, stay put. Um, figure out what's working, figure out what needs some work, and that can help you decide where to put your effort, decide on goals for engagement or impact or growth. Um, th those measures can be, you know, helpful and important. Uh, but I would say start with the conversations, the relationship building, and, and the learning about people's journeys through your project and how they are similar to but different from what you might expect or imagine. And continue just to communicate and be really clear about your focus. You know, we've learned this, and so now we're going to work on that. It's a great message to share with everyone. Kind of uh, alerts them to new opportunities to maybe try out a new form of contribution or to help you figure out a new contribution pathway through your project. That, that's going to be a powerful way to give to your project as well. Um, running out of time, but I'll say it's important then to reflect, you know, take a look at that mountain of engagement as it is now, maybe take a look at it as you would like it to be in the future, and, you know, use that feedback from folks who can help you make that journey as leaders within a project. We always suggest if you are going to collect any kind of like 
qualitative data, personally identifiable information and keep it and use it as part of your mountain of engagement, please have a strong data policy, data privacy policy, perhaps at least as strong as Mozilla's. And, um, you know, it's really just about learning all the different ways people move through your project that you observe, but maybe didn't imagine, right? Uh, it, it's a way to learn kind of like what's actually happening to compare it to what you are expecting to have happen. Uh, and then to either align or adjust those things so that they include the expectations and the desires of the people who are working on all the different parts of your project or your community together at once. I will kind of wrap it there and invite uh, questions and answers now and just point you to the slides uh, if you would like to go through <laughs> at a more leisurely pace and to find some like graphic organizers and links to resources at the bottom. Thank you very much, Chad. I feel like we sure. should just um, <laughs> keep this recording and like play in in every single chord from this point on. That was so clear. Very good. And, um, good. and yeah, just just very very great um, introduction to the uh, mountain of engagement, uh, folks. If you have any questions for Chad, please do put it in the Zoom chat or um, in the question section of the notes. We're now hovering around 904. Um, I see one question about uh, data policy. Uh, where can I add a disclaimer of the data policy? I'm um, not quite sure who asked this. Maybe this person can also, if you don't mind, um, maybe unmute and clarify a little bit. Hi, maybe it's not clear, it's, it's me, Alejandro. I'm wondering about this data private policy. Uh, where to go, like is in the code of conduct or in, for instance, where I can reflect in a GitHub repository, is like a particular yeah. file that I need to add or? Um, I, yeah, I think perhaps even as its own separate file. Um, and you can look around for examples that kind of address the, the data uses you might have in mind. Um, you could think, you could definitely, I think you should think about it from like a, uh, participation guidelines kind of point of view, like what are the ethical ways in which we're going to deal with folks' data, but maybe make it its own own file, you know, like data policy or data privacy file, data privacy policy, uh, and just, you know, be clear about things such as, you know, what you're collecting and why, who has access for how long, when is it going to be destroyed, um, and depending on where your project is or where your contributors are, really, you know, pay attention to and, and learn a bit about, um, you know, local, regional, national, uh, policies like GDPR. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Alejandro. Um, we have a question from Elisa. Um, uh, no, sorry, that was just an addition to what Chad was saying. Uh, what's important is to also clarify if you're reusing the data for a different purpose uh, afterwards. Definitely. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, also um, important to consider. Yeah, um, I, I do see a question in the document uh, from Emmy about, you know, is there a are there pros and cons of like interviews? Are there less demanding ways or the, in terms of people's time to collect feedback? I would say absolutely. Like, um, so I talked a lot about you know stories, relationship building, conversations, things like that. But you know. Uh, as with many things, it's probably very important to create multiple ways into this conversation. So you might, you know, share out um, a, a brief initial survey, you know, one minute to tell us about, you know, uh, you know, what are you working on right now? What are you getting back from the project? Do you feel it's equitable? Is there anything else you'd like us to know? Is there anything else you'd like to work on in the project? You know, something very short to everyone. And then an invitation at the end or a link to sign up for an appointment slot to chat further about their experience, you know, from the first time they heard about the project to where they are now on it. You can combine methods, um, but the, the big idea is to um, not, a, you know, to, to move away from kind of like hierarchies or, or things where people might imagine there's this trajectory they're supposed to follow in your project or that you think people are following and to really focus on what is actually happening. What are people actually doing? Why are they staying in these roles or moving between roles or leaving the project or coming to the project in the first place? And then to use an understanding of each of those, uh, you know, entry points, exit points, uh, transition points uh, to, to 
kind of like document and suggest what might work. You know, some people do this and then they try that and then they try that. Uh, just to broaden the ways people can imagine themselves being in that community in that project um, in case they have, uh, ever do feel stuck or they do wonder, you know, how do I move around or like, do I have to have this particular thing in my CV to do this, that or the other thing, you know, just learning more about what's actually happening in your project and moving away from your assumptions about what's happening can help you create a better, I think, contributor journey. Thank you. Um... Yeah, yeah, no, um, just very, um, yeah, very refreshing and, and, and great reminders there as well. Um, I just uh, hoping to give folks some more seconds to think of questions maybe. Um, sure. Not afraid to leave the awkward silence. Um, I see Danny's also left um, a link to some slides that we've used in previous cohorts. Um, so uh, in case you want a visual uh, to accompany what the uh, chat has just talked about, um, that's quite useful as well uh, to refer to. Um, see no more questions at this point. So I just want to say a big thank you to Chad for joining us. And um, yeah, lovely to have thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to, to open the call with you. Please, if you have any feedback, pass it along to your organizers. And while I would love to stay, I must now go and pick up a kid. Thank you, be well, and I hope to join you again sometime. Thank you, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Okay, all of us who are still here, um, we're heading into a breakout discussion. So um, Chaz has mentioned valued exchanges and thinking about value exchanges uh, in your community. So um, this is what this breakout is going to be about. Um, so I'll introduce it while you will set us up um, in the uh, breakout rooms. So we have a couple of prompts. Um, I think one, two, three, four, five. Yes. Um, you are asked to choose two to three. So whichever interests you and, and your group. Um, so we'd like you to use these prompts to reflect on what are you giving to your community project or organization? Um, what does it mean to be giving back? And if there are gaps, how might you close them? So the prompts uh, are on the notes on under line 118. Um, so yeah, just think a bit about, um, yeah, sort of like what, what you're giving or what people within your projects are giving each other what are you getting back and think about sort of that balance between you know, what you're giving and what you're getting back and um, how does that relate to the culture that you're trying to build. Um, as usual, um, we have written and spoken room so you could use the note section to document uh, your discussion if you're in a written room um, and spoken, yeah, please do that as well so that we can all share um, what we, and learn from each other what we've discussed. Um, I think this is 10 minutes, yes. And so each room will have three people. Um, each person will then have around two, two and a half to three minutes um, to, uh, exactly, to um, speak. Questions? All right, if, you're, if you have any problems or questions within your breakout room, press the ask for help button. But if we're ready, uh, just check it out. Perfect. We can go. Have fun. How to uh, keep the community active, alive, and motivated. I mean, um, as an organizer, you have to do a great, great job and um, to put always or um, to, to um, um, arise new questions, new tasks, new work packages. That's the way to go. So the people are motivated to work on the project or whatever it is. What's your opinion on that? Do you mean that you find, do you, did I understand that you, you, uh, you're finding it quite effortful? Like it, it takes a lot of time for community managers? Is that uh... Not the effort. Uh, what what to do to um, keep the people motivated in your network in your community you're trying to build. I understand that. There's uh, lots of 
experienced and <laughs> community managers here. So any tips that you would like, anyone would like to share with the ELMS uh, group? Well, I, I, I just thought that you just need to support them in the hardest moments because they will, they will remember that. And that's uh, like, for, from my experience, that's the moments uh, which needs to be supported, like uh, with the hands, hand, helpful hands. Okay. That's some, some, some hint. What's about survey? Is it um, um, good to start surveys on a regular base to get a feedback on what you do and the topic and whatever? It is. Is it a good way to go, or is it out school? Is it your? Um, yeah, I'll volunteer a thought on that. Um, so it's something we try to do a lot with OLS, actually. Um, although I would also be wary of surveying the same people over and over. One thing we have is that when with OLS we sort of do a mid cohort survey, which I think we need to do that very soon actually, just don't come to think of it, and a post OLS cohort survey. Um, and the mentors are going to be the same or sometimes from time to time, but at least the participants are going to be different. So hopefully we're not like wearing them out too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think surveys, um, ideally so kept shortish, are a great way to get feedback from people and then you can improve your behaviors as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, yeah, this is, I, I, I agree with you. This is like a, a very, it's a, it's a big challenge for, I mean, for me personally, definitely. Um, but so I would love to learn from um, folks as well. Maybe have some tips. But I, I like what Eva mentioned as well, which is show that you care. Um, I really, I learned, this is the, the, biggest thing I learned from the rest of the OLS team when I first joined the team that, you know, like when you think about a big community with a lot of people, you think, okay, I'm just one person, like, why would they care, right? It, it is those moments when someone take that extra step um, for you that really, you know, keeps you motivated and makes you do the same for the other. So it's really going back to what Chad said about building the culture that you want to build, something that you may want to consider is, you know, is this something that I want to see in my community that people go, go out of their way to help other people? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's, that's, I see that people are motivated by this and I, I personally have experienced this that motivates me to further participate, but that's me. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the question and, and for the discussion. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I see a, really a lot of great notes on the on the um, notes document. So please feel free to read each other's thoughts and, and jump in as well. Um, if uh, I see some folks are doing it as well here on the notes, which is great to see. So um, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, with that, I hand over to Demi. Thanks, Demi. It is my pleasure to introduce Batul, who's going to speak to us about using personas and pathways to build community. Over to you, Batul. Oh, thank you, Tony. Um, I can't share the screen, so it's uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Try now. Yeah, I, I can. Thank you. you. Can you see it right now? Okay, good. Thank you. So disclaimer from the very start, uh, I would not describe myself as an expert in persona and pathway at all. Um, all that I'm going to speak about is from my experience with the open science communities and open source project. And I borrowed, actually I stole a lot of these materials from the previous uh, talks by Penn and Elda from the previous cohort calls. So I am Betul Marzouk, I am postdoc in Kaimar Computation Biologist, and I'm actually a mentee in this, um, in this cohort with the wonderful Lena and Mahlati, who is also in the call, and my BI, who is uh, Mahir Ajaji. Uh, 
Uh, I've also, I'm also very interested in the adoption of open science practices in the Middle East. So we initiated an open science community here in Saudi Arabia at the start of this year with the help of the op uh, open life science program as well. Uh, I'm very active within the art communities and one of the Lady Global Committees and organizer for the Ladies Dhamma. So what is, why bother and what is, uh, Persona and pathway. So persona and pathway is actually two design element that in, they're not just important to communicate your project to stakeholder, but also it's going to help you to attract the right user or the right community members to your community. So it does help you to understand who make up your community and you how can you maximize and support them to get involved and develop as just shall describe the amount of engagement. So by persona, we mean users or community members, and by pathway, we mean the potential route for them. Uh, I'm going to describe a bit of tips that I've learned from Anilda and from the Turing way, of how you can identify personas and pathway for your community. But if you still do find it difficult to identify persona and pathway, it might mean that you might need uh, to research more about your community, collect more information or understand your community better. So one of the things that Ben used to really put emphasis on that uh, when we attract users or community members, we don't attract them just to so they can support us, but actually so we can support them to empower them so they can collaborate to grow and level up. So when we start to think about persona, you want to start to think who is your community and who are you trying to support? Who do you think is missing from the community? Usually persona is described this way. It's like fictional character you can create based on your research that can represent your community. And it's really uh, good that you give that a real name, uh, a real job, then you can describe what uh, positive trend they experience, what negative headache they have. Uh, but this is not helping a lot. So there is a few tools. One of them is called the Persona Canvas, uh, you can find this uh, from the Turing Way chapter in Persona Creation. And this canvas really explains the little detail that you want to include in your persona. So you want to start here with a real name, a real role of that person. And then you want to start to try to understand or imagine what kind of need that person might have. Because once you understand what need they might have, you understand what why would they come to your community in the first place? And then you want to identify positive trend, positive opportunity they have, uh, goals and hubs. But at the same time, also you want to identify headaches and fears they do have. And by headaches and fears, this could be something in their work, it could be something in their life. And once you have all this information, you begin to understand the kind of community member you have within your community or you want to attract or you are missing within the community itself. Uh, having used this canvas, sometimes very, very overwhelming to come up with all of these details, especially if you just started your own community. So one of the tips that Anilda gave me, and she also explained it in one of the cohort call, I think, is doing this fish bond analysis and fish bond analysis is basically is analyzing the problem you have in mind. So the fish head is the problem you have in mind. So this is the problem, the reason why you start to build your own community. And then the fish bond is uh, the causes behind this problem. So you have all these causes and you have these many branches that can be grouped together into category. And this is helping you to really analyze the cause you have within the causes that really motivate you to build the community and what problem you have. Once you identify all this, you start with something called the theory of change. And the theory of change is just basically if a way of inducing a change in, in your community. Once you know exactly the problem, you analyze the causes, now you can identify the target people that you can reach out to them. Once you identify these people, now you know what kind of activity you needed to bring this a change. Once you know the activity, you can design some matrix that you can measure the effect of this activity and attracting these people. 
and also you understand what kind of benefit this wave might have and then what kind of long-term effect you might have. You start with some kind of assumption, then you really try to compare this with the actual impact that you have, as Chad explained earlier as well. Uh, so this really did help me. And when I started, like the very, very first draft I made uh, for the open science community in Saudi Arabia, that we do have the main problem that we do have is low research productivity we have. And although we do have the facility, but we don't have research productivity in Saudi Arabia. And the impact that we wanted to see initially is we wanted to see some institutional change and adoption for open science practices within institution level. And long-term outcome we wanted to see is we want to promote some quality and integrity in the scientific research and foster, and that could help foster innovation system within the country itself. We, then we started to identify short-term outcomes, output and kind of activities that might help us within to reach that impact. So this really could be very, very helpful when you start to design uh, the kind of persona you want within your community. Uh, However, growing a community of participants around your project does not mean just bringing or attracting these people, but also moving these people around. This way comes the amount of engagement, which Chad just explained very, very beautifully. So I'm just going to go very, very briefly about pathways. Thus, once you identify a persona, now you can identify the pathway for that persona. Uh, and you want to identify multiple persona and multiple pathway, or just one, because you want to capture all the spectrum of persona and pathway within your community. So pathway is the journey that user or participant can take in by engaging within your community or your project from the very, very first contact to potentially the leadership. This could be something like, so you start by imagining how this persona discover this community, then how they would con how would their first contact be, how they would participate, and how can you make that participation more sustainable and potentially maybe in leadership. Not all pathway end up with leadership. Um, Shad just explained that some pathway, some people don't want to go that way. That's why designing the appropriate pathway to the appropriate persona is really important. So in this case, for example, Fatima met someone who took part within the community, then she attended a workshop organized by the community, and the very first participation for her through a community call, and one of the sustained participation when she tried to help in translating some materials to Arabic, and then started to propose this project and encourage her friend to take part. And eventually she become, uh, she led one of the working group and start engaging with others in behalf of the community. So this is the kind of pathway you would want to imagine. However, um, as your community grows, pathways is also going to change and persona is also going to change. Uh, so you would, you would gather more information, you would gather more data and this data is going to improve this pathway, this is going to improve the way or the assumption you have about this persona. Uh, and the key message that I want to out of this talk is, um, and something that I've learned personally, is uh, what other community need might be totally different when you try to apply it to your own community. So adapting to community need is, is really, really important. And another used to say that a lot, changes in community takes really, really time and takes a lot of patience. Yeah, um, so, so be patient when you try to introduce these changes. As I said, all the resources, all the things I've said, you can find them in another talk and all three and burnt talk and all two. These are, Turing Way, the Mozilla Science Lab, and this article is very, very uh, informative about persona and pathway if you want to take a look at them. And thank you so much. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Patul. That was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, lots for me to think about there. Um, so we have a question coming in from somebody I'm not quite sure who. Um, they're welcome to unmute themselves and ask in person. Otherwise, I will uh, I will happily read out what they're writing through. 
uh, that, that was me, sorry. Maybe it just went a bit too long. So, I mean, a bit, if you could tell a bit, how was the, like, the initial steps that you took or you and the initial members of the community to reach out to the first members and how did you decide who to contact and how did you contact them? And also, did you already have these personas in mind when you first reached out to them? Or is this something that after having like a critical mass of people, you start seeing the patterns and like try to bring more people that would follow the same path? Okay. Uh all the personas that we built at the very, very beginning changed completely as the community grew. So, so, so yeah, all the assumption was totally different. People start to come in because we try to hold activities within like conferences that are held within Saudi Arabia. So that's how people get to know about us more. And then we would have one-to-one -one call explaining about the community, what they can do. And that's how they get started to get involved. And then once we see like most of them, they come, when we speak about open science, it's very like big umbrella. And um, there's qualitative research, quantitative research. You can apply it in different ways. It's just, it's so complicated. So we start to adapt to, to what kind of uh, discipline that people, these people do have and try to like explain in that way. But as I said, yeah, the persona totally changed completely from the beginning as, as the community grow. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure maybe you and Emia and the community manager here have like more elaborate answer about this and can explain it better. They have more experience. I think what Bertel said is beautiful and I'm so inspired that, you know, that note again about, you know, having one-to-one -one calls to explain to people. I mean, a lot of times from what I see, you know, it's very hard to, especially if you're online, right? Like it's really hard to go from the step where you're just sort of observing to, you know, participating in something. And so having someone to reach out to you, I mean, it really depends on the person, I suppose, but, but having someone to reach out to you and really listen to what you need, um, spot on. Couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, hey, Batul, we have one more question. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure who it's coming from. Um, if if the author would like to unmute themselves, they're welcome to. Otherwise, uh, I can jump I in. <laughs> Hi. Um, so we recently designed some personas in our community based on some data, not completely out of nothing. Uh, and now we would like to like get some sort of feedback from the community if they actually recognize themselves in those personas or what's their opinion about that. And we were wondering how to do so. So we thought about the survey, but then why should they in like how to present this, uh, why, why, why should they actually fill a survey about personas and what other ways can we test this? If you have any suggestions. Uh, okay, so, so you're trying to see if the persona that you guys draw does it represent the community that you have right now. Uh, I've never tried that, honestly, and I don't have experience of yeah, trying to match it up because we, yeah, uh, I I'm not sure, honestly, how would you do that if a survey would be a good option to go with or not. Um, if anyone here within the call did have any kind of experience with it. I've had I a wonder if it, run. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I wonder if that sort of... Um, exploration might be particularly well suited to a gathering in the project. Say if you had a, a hackathon or something like that, you could present a couple of slides as part of the intro presentation and just say kind of, hey, we've been working on, on these kind of personas because we really want to understand um, the type of people who are involved in this project. Uh, these are the types of people that, we, um, that we've identified. And then maybe people could do a kind of just a quick poll that said kind of, I am this person, this person, this person, or other. And if you had a huge kind of other spike, then you might be like, huh, we need to expand what we were thinking about. Um, that might be a, a kind of quick, low effort way to get people's feedback on that.
I was also thinking, you know, when um, folks have like a, a meme and they say like, tell us whether you're one, two, three, four, five, and six and quote tweet it or something like that. I could totally see making a bunch of pictures and asking people to like share that with other people in the world and make, make it fun. Um, I have no idea if this would work. It just like popped into my brain as an exciting thing right now, but now I want to go and try it. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, I think if there aren't any other questions, I will pass on to um, to Yo to introduce our next section. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, so, folks, um, our next talk we have Anna, um, who is an outreachy organizer, um, to talk about mentored contributions and community interactions. Um, and Anna, I'm sure you introduce yourself far better than I will. So, over to you. Thank you so much for this invite. Let me share my screen. Let me know if it's sharing. Can That's you see good. them? Yeah. So hi, I'm Anna. I don't have an exact title I go by. I've worn and still wear many hats. I'm known as an outreach organizer. Outreach is this awesome internship program for underrepresented groups in technology that allows them to work with free and open source projects. I'm also known for my technical writing work in open communities such as Open Collective and Wikimedia and my obsession with plants and weird ergonomic keyboards. I'm also a Muslim leader's alum. And I've taken interest in gardening this year and I've come to realize that that activity and creating, managing, and fostering an open community have much more in common than I initially thought. I was really nervous when I started taking care of plants, which is much akin to the way I felt when I started participating more and more in open communities. You see, I had this fear that no matter what I read or how much experience I had with living things, I would put up killing all my plants, or in this case, of all the roles I've taken in open projects, uh, would I have what it takes to make them flourish? And an even better question than that is, what does it take to make a community flourish? I know that one of the things that may make us so anxious is that open communities and gardening or work is so transparent. It's in the open. There's dozens of eyes on us. If a plant isn't happy, maybe its leaves will start going yellow. They will droop. And if a community isn't happy, you will feel that it isn't as vibrant as it once was. You have to have many difficult conversations and some of them may be really public. I really like this section of the open leadership framework because it's a direct question to the question I just made. To make a community flourish, you should build for decision-making, delegation, event planning, community management, management, and mentoring. And part of receiving new members in our communities is much like getting new plans. You want to make sure that what you already have in terms of members infrastructure, documentation is well supported and that you have the headspace, the capacity to welcome them and welcome them well. You also want to make sure that you have the structure to keep them around once they settle. But you don't want your plants or your new members to stay the same. You want them to grow, to thrive, to flourish. For plants, this would involve providing them with enough appropriate sunlight. You will fertilize them once in a while, clean their leaves if there's too much dust on them. But what does that look like for a contributor, for a member of a community? I really like this slide that shows how people can progress from a first contribution direction to a role of leadership. It mentions that mentorship is a sustainable way to bring new leaders. And I'll argue that is exactly the care instructions for new contributors. We see this quite a lot in outreach. -y. We have something we call a contribution phase within our application process. During that contribution phase, applicants interact with communities and start crafting contributions that reflect the roles they will take on if they become interns. 
but uh, a significant amount of applicants make their first contribution to open source during that contribution period. Many of them learn about communities they've never heard about before, and many of them stick around, even if they aren't selected as interns. And our mentors say this is because our contribution period encourages collaboration across mentors, community members, and applicants. We foster an environment that provides a safe space to develop new skills, meet new people, become a better person. And that's why we say that contributing to open communities is a two-way street. Everyone involved gets something out of those interactions, those contributions. As leaders of an open community, you provide a platform for people to become a better version of themselves. And contributors, community members provide input that will help your project, your community become a better version of itself. But what does that look like in practice? Uh, I'm a bit biased towards documentation. I'm a technical writer after all, but I can't stress enough that documentation is something that can make or break a community. Remember that your community doesn't have someone 24 seven available to make an introduction to every single person that, it find, that finds it. Your documentation is the face and the soul of the community on a repo that materializes as a really good read me, a file that documents the many awesome, awesome some ways they can contribute to your community, a code of conduct that above all is a reflection of what you want your community to be, a license, a roadmap, issues that are labeled with newcomer friendly, how wanted, first times only. Oh, and in open communities, years can go by without actually meeting the people you work with either in real life or virtually, it's always a great moment when you all decide to meet each other and help each other. It creates such a great connection. I also love the idea of mentor issues proposed here. Now, something I want to mention is that the community should have a good idea of what is the mentorship style they strive for. And I also think it's important to recognize that some people may be great at a, at a specific style of mentorship, technical, for instance, but may not wish to follow another type of mentorship, something more social or deeply related to project management. One thing that outreach does to balance out people's different, me different mentorship styles is encouraging communities to build mentorship teams to come to have co-mentors when i was an outreach intern a long time ago i had two mentors with different backgrounds and which one of them would help me figure out something different about wikimedia which was the community i was working with and about myself i really like these poem pointers for mentor issues but i really want to add something one thing I do advise, and this is something that I've observed in other communities, is that you've got to be honest about the scope of the contributions you're looking for. There may be some things you think that aren't adequate to address in your project, but somewhere else, or maybe there are things about the side of your project you don't want to have changed. For instance, in outreach, we always try to use some really friendly, kind language in our documentation, emails, you name it. This is a part of our identity as a program, and it's not something that we want to change. So that's out of scope for pull requests and such. I also agree with the points made here. Be gentle, be kind, thank them for their time, commit, the responding, commit to responding to their inquiries on a reasonable time frame. Thank them for the work, give good feedback, ask questions, guide them, be an engaged mentor. I can't stress enough how important it is to recognize their work. And years ago, I wrote a blog post called Open Code is Different from Working Open. And one of the things I said there was collaborative efforts take a lot more than just making the code available for, to anyone. It takes recognition. Volunteers pour a lot of hours and energy into their contributions because they feel they are gaining some, something out of that experience. And as most of them perform their duties in their spare time, contributing is a privilege that many people can afford. Their participation has to be encouraged, appreciated, credited. 
communication as you need to include people from all kinds of backgrounds and technical levels. Never assume someone is, the, is in the same technical level as you. Ask questions and follow up appropriately, but without being condescending, listening, offering a platform. They can discuss important aspects of the project isn't enough when you don't listen to their concerns and address them properly. More importantly, when your perspective is limited, take into account different, different points of view and step back and apologize if you make a mistake. Caring, writing a code of conduct and actually enforcing it isn't optional and it isn't trivial either. Don't cut corners on this. And setting your project free, you should act as tomorrow is your last day at the project and make everything to make its existence not dependent on you delegate and document your work. But again, what does that look like? It looks like hanging out on the project IRC or answering any new newcomer questions, helping newcomers to GitHub and pointing people to good first issues and organizing community events to welcome those new contributions. So I want to bring, bring this up again, to read this, this drum again. Establish clear expectations, communicate regularly, provide structure through the review processes, encourage constantly, and model best practice. And I think these next steps are good next steps. Think about it. Are there, are there any issues you can start mentoring? Do you need to set up a, set up a chat channel somewhere for casual contribution inquiries? Or should you mentor any of your current contributors? That's all. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much. Can we just have a huge round of applause for Anna? Um, so folks, if you have any questions, please do add them either into the Zoom chat. You can unmute now if you prefer, or um, you, we can also add them in the um, I want to say HackMD, but it's not a HackMD. It is an Etherpad. Um, add them in the Etherpad. And we do have um some notes um i would like to learn more about mentorship style um does anyone have any comments i want to expand on what that what, what that was about i can promise you to drop some links in the etherpad i don't have them handy but i do i have learned from a few mentorship resources that i can share thank you so much anna um, so we have uh, time for a question or two more, actually, if anyone has any. Oh, Alejandro, go for it. Hi, Anna. Thank you for the presentation. And in the process also, like how to recognize the cloud contributors award. And I wonder when you are presenting in traditional conference, you want to present about your open source project and you cannot add the names of the contributors only like the names of the maintainers or something like that. So how they can have credits in this kind of format of traditional conference, you know, that you only can recognize probably in the presentation or, or in the something and the article that they're producing, but not in the this traditional conference. So, so something that um, outside formal conferences is this is something that you can take some inspiration from. Uh, I've worked with Open Collective and they have a newsletter and they try to acknowledge contributions in their newsletters. So if you actually make a, a compilation of meaningful contributions you had in a time frame, maybe a month or six months, a semester, a year, you could probably mention that on the presentation. So something like getting a, a lot of boxes with text that's may state the contributions they made in their name and say this was those were the contributions we received over a year or six months this is a, a good way to acknowledge them so in on github repos some people make halls of fames or they make a, a file called contributors that lists every single person that has already submitted a commit to that GitHub repo. So you can find many ways you compile that information and maybe think of creative ways you may uh, visualize them on a slide. I think, but I think that 
that idea of taking notes about those meaningful contributions and mention them on a slide or two would be a great idea for a formal conference. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a note from Emmy um, that on academic papers, you can use the credit uh, taxonomy uh, to define who has contributed what uh, with a nice link to credit.niso.org um, in the chat. And I'll also add myself that it's not uncommon in some academic papers to have a consortium as an author. Um, so that would actually just be a whole group of people. So, you know, let's say the Open Life Science Project might be the consortium that would put as a senior or first author for a publication in, in a scenario like this. Um, and then obviously somewhere else you'd actually have to enumerate who was in that consortium. But it sort of gets around having to have 5,000 authors on a paper, for example. Um, so we have a tiny bit of time uh, left. We're actually not completely short on time for once, which is astonishing. Um, does anyone have any other questions they would like to ask? Um, I'll just check the etherpad, see if there's anything else here. Not yet. I know Elissa has uh, mentioned the um, CSCCA on line 223, um, which is indeed a great uh, community management or scientific community management um, group uh, community to be involved with. Um, but yeah, any more questions, please bring them on. Alejandro, is that a legacy hand from before? It is, <laughs> it was. Emmy has a hand. I don't want to take everyone's time, but uh, but since I have the chance, um, I, Anna, I guess you mentioned uh, documentation, and uh, I what I want to ask is um, if you have any tips for sort of troubleshooting them, if that makes sense, like making sure that it does work for the people, like it's written in a way that works for people that we intended to work for, at least. I think this is one of those things that you kind of learn the hard way, like when someone comes with you, comes to you with a question, or they open an issue, or they send you a private message. Usually, you usually have this ideal version of readers for your documentation, but you only get a really good sense if it's working or not when the emails and the messages are coming through. So I think the most kind thing to do is actually being open to criticism and feedback and always in the, trying to learn what, what's about documentation that isn't that clear, ask questions, try to understand what what's going on, if there's anything that you can add or if you can schedule a session with that person and they can point out what's not that clear. I think those things are the way to build a really good documentation because if you only write it for yourself and for the ideas that you have, it won't be as effective. It won't serve the purpose that is informing and helping your community. Thank you. I also find that um, with documentation, if it's missing, um, but you do have a lot of new contributors coming on, you usually quite quickly figure out what, where it's missing. Um, and if you're really, if you're really lucky, the contributors will help you. Uh, if not, at least you know where the gaps are. Um, but I remember seeing um, on a talk yesterday, someone saying one way you can really help is test it and complain. They said, please do complain. <laughs> so encouraging complaints. Um, I like complaints, but encourage those complaints because they always um, show you where the gaps are. Um, yeah, but during my internship with Wikimedia, I was a first time contributor to Wikimedia and my mentors were like, they had 10 years, 15 years under their belts. And I constantly found things that they never heard about or they never thought about just because I had this really good, fresh set of eyes on their documentation. And I was poking holes in every single section of their documentation, coming with questions that some 
they couldn't even answer, but ga it gave them a lot of food for thought, basically. Thank you I so love much. It. Okay, Emmy, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Anna, once again for joining us and for for um, yeah, really uh, inspiring us and helping us nurture our community communal community garden <laughs> of all lessers. Um, so I uh, oh, I have eight minutes to close this call. Um, <laughs> not sure. Really. After this call, um, we'd love for you to have a go at some of the the sort of frameworks or, or exercises, or whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, that we were introduced during this call. Um, so we have, uh, uh, as Patul was mentioning, a canvas for the personas that you can try out. There's a link in the Etherpad on line 241. Um, and uh, there's also the amount of engagement, I believe, uh, that's uh, from line, 100, line 242. That's the document that's linking to sort of a, a table, a uh, possible of lines of documentation, instruction to help you think through this. Um, there is also a guide in, uh, for uh, dealing with and handling unconscious bias of our own. So you can have a read through that as well. Um, and there is the lovely Torumi chapter on a persona. Sorry, I'm jumping around, but it's also in 241. Uh, line 241 um, that really is quite helpful um, to visit and to learn um, and reflect on what you've learned in this call. And next week is already week nine. <laughs> you will have your mentor and mentee call. Um, so please remember to attend that. Um, if you haven't already invited an expert to join the call, your mentor mentee calls, please um, do try and look through our expert list and see if you would like to invite someone. Um, as Anna was saying, an extra pair of eyes always helps. So someone with a fresh mind um, to come in and, and um, discuss and share uh, the experience with you and your mentor. Um, it's really helpful at this point of your project. Um, we also have a, a skill up call. Um, so this is gonna be um, a couple of folks from our community, uh, from the OLS community and beyond. Um, to share about their career journeys. Um, so we're gonna have a couple of folks uh, talk about their post-academic post careers as well uh, into funding, into policy making, into social entrepreneurship, et cetera. So that will be next Wednesday at 12.30 London time. Hopefully you can join us there. And week after we will have another cohort call um, that will be on open science, uh, second one on open science on knowledge dissemination. Uh, you'll get an email next week that will talk more about the details of this call. I think I've covered everything. If you have any questions for us, um, please do feel free to leave it on the Etherpad on line 252 or stay behind. If not, you are free to go. Oh, we have a feedback session. So do let us know what you feel about, how you feel about this call. Oh, we're five minutes early. <laughs> Thank this you everyone never for joining. Happened. I mean, <laughs> yeah. sorry, just one small question to skill up call. Um, should we register for that or is there a link to the call somewhere? And in... yeah, uh, you don't have to register. Um, it's uh, on the it, the link to join the call will be on the notes of the call, and I'm gonna put the URL here right now, but you'll also get that in the email that is coming next Monday to your mailbox. Okay, great, thank you. It's not quite ready yet, the notes, but so the link will be on there. So um, yeah, just the usual way you join OLS calls, I suppose. <laughs> because it sounds amazing, I'd like to join. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, um, should we stop recording and call it a, a day? Thank <laughs> you.